Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Sizemore here from the Transition Coordination Center. Uh, we're here from American Systems, and we have several subject matter experts around the room to present the material to today. But before we get started, I want to go over some housekeeping rules. And we have about, uh, we're, we're just shy of, of about half of our participants logged in right now. So I expect that there's going to be many people joining, so we may have to repeat some of this at, at some point. But the first thing I want to let you know, as you can see on the screen there, is that this meeting is being recorded and will be available later for access on GSA's Interact website once we get through all the process and to make that available. That will be up and available, so if you want to hear it again, you can find it eventually and listen to it. Uh, second bullet is there. We ask you to mute all of your computer microphones and telephones and anything that can make noise on the distant end. If you don't, we'll get feedback or other noise that uh, will drive everybody crazy. So if you haven't already, go ahead and mute whatever device, device you have and turn off any speaker from projecting into anything. So that will help us. And I'm sure we'll have to make several reminders. We've got over 250 participants registered. There's going to be a lot of people. There's usually some offenders, and uh, we'll, we'll deal with them as, as they come up. The uh, second thing is that we'd ask you to do is once we get over to the presentation, there will be a question and answer pod that will be visible. And we'd ask you to put your questions, any question that you have pertaining to the material, load it into the Q&A pod, and we will see that here on this end, and we'll take time throughout the presentation to pause and answer those questions and address any comments and also open the phone line really for dialogue. So one thing we would ask you to do, though, is if you have a specific question on a specific slide, please put the slide number in. Transition? Come on. We're going to go watch it in here. Where's that? So we've got a hot mic on the other end. Could you please mute horse. your mic? Red horse. At Red Horse. <laughs> So please, Mike, please uh, mute that mic on the distant end. Thank you. We do, we do in, uh, encourage uh, collaboration and participation. It is a workshop, very much a, a back and forth format, not just a lecture. You'll also see when we get over to the, the presentation that you can download a copy of today's slides in the files pod. Just click on that and you'll be able to download that. You'll see it. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you have any questions, put those in the Q&A pod, and we'll tell you how to get that done. Finally, at the, at the end, when we wrap everything up and we've taken all the attendance and everything and we know exactly who was here, we will be sending completion certificates. And those of you that need continuous learning point credit, there is 1.5 CLPs offered for this course. So. Uh, Finally, uh, my last slide in this welcome portion is to talk about what happens if the audio or the video capability go down or we have problems with it. On this slide, I don't expect you to copy this. We have an email that we'll send out, but we do have a backup Adobe Meeting Space room, and we've even got a backup to the backup. So hopefully we won't have to use either one of those, but if we do, Every registered participant will receive an email. We've got that all queued up and ready to go. Just give us a few minutes to work through that, look in your email, and you'll be directed to where to go to, to join a backup session. So that's it for the welcome portion. I'm going to drop over to the workshop portion now. Now you'll see the chat pod. You'll see the files pod over in the right-hand corner. And to download that presentation, if you just click on it one time, then your, the download button at the bottom of that pod will open up, and you'll be able to, to save that to your computer and follow along or reference back to it. So with that, I will turn the floor over to our first speaker, which is Debbie Wren. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you are in another time zone or if you stayed up late watching the Nationals win the World Series. It feels like morning. <laughs> we can sleep in tomorrow um, or go to bed early tonight. Uh, I'm Debbie Wren. I am the director of the transition program for 
GSAs, and transition to EIS. Today we have what we hope is an exhilarating workshop for you. We have a room full of subject matter experts on how to mitigate transition delays. And uh, I would like to especially thank and welcome our EIS contractors who are participating with us today. They're bringing their perspective and their insights to share with you. As Scott said, we do expect this to be a, an interactive discussion with plenty of opportunities to pause in the presentation to give you a chance to share your own story. Uh, best practices, lessons learned, and ask questions of the experts that we have available. So please don't hesitate to give a comment, put a question in the Q&A pod, or speak up during the open Q&A period. So we're going to start with the description of the, the roadmap, and then through the series of speakers that we have here, we'll talk about the objectives of the workshop and some background information, and then get into installation intervals and understanding um, strategies for mitigating delays that, that are possible during the implementation process um, with a conclusion to follow that. So uh, it's always a good starting point, whether you've been with us since we started this transition planning in 2015 or if you've just joined into this program. It's good to take a look at the schedule and the roadmap for how to get to the end goal. And that end goal is, of course, to have all the services that are on our expiring contracts, that's networks, WITS 3, and the regional local service contract, disconnected from those contracts before they expire in May of 2023. Um, ideally, those services would be replaced on EIS and the implementation of those replacement services is what we're going to talk about today. So the first milestone that we had in the near term was to have all of the agency's task orders awarded on EIS for the replacement services by the end of September, what, three weeks ago or so, four weeks ago. Unfortunately, we had only one agency that met that milestone. So um, that what that means is Everyone is at risk of having delays in implementation that further complicate their ability to meet that May 31st, 2023 uh, deadline. So work is backlogged already, and what we need to do is explore options for expediting what comes after this. Um, and we will be keeping a close eye on task order awards between now and March 31st of 2020. And um, at, after that time, we will be looking at how to limit the agencies that can use the extended contracts based on um, what progress they've made in awarding their task orders as well as other many other factors uh, on those agencies agency-specific situations that we will uh, consider for what happens after March of 2020. And then uh, what's not depicted on here, but you'll see it on our website, gsa.gov slash EIS transition, the next big measured milestone is to be 50% disconnected in March of 2021 followed by 90% disconnected in March of 2022, and that gives us a, a little breathing room to capture only those things that fell off of plans and perhaps had realized risks of implementation delays that were unforeseen um, before the contracts expire in May of 2023. So that's the big picture of where we are going. So with that, I am going to turn it over back over to Scott Sizemore to take us into the workshop. Thank you, Debbie. So you can see the objectives that we've established for today. Uh, we're going to talk about, and we, you know, we hope that at the end of the day, everybody can recognize some of the common transition delays that, that are out there. 
And then also, more importantly, you know, number two is to understand and to be able to apply those effective strategies to help mitigate delays on your end. So that's our objectives, pretty straightforward and simple. I want to talk about just briefly next our panel of subject matter experts. You've heard from Debbie. In just a moment, you're going to hear from Bill Kinter and Chris Hamby. Also in the room with us today are Jasper Saunders from Mettel, Andrea Hudson from AT&T, and Nick Maddich from BT Federal. They're all here with us in the room. And there are other subject matter experts that are joined on the phone with us as well. Uh, just another reminder to, to mute, please, on the, end, on the distant end if you can, unless you are going to speak up. If we mute everybody, it also mutes our subject matter experts on the distant end, and it just becomes too much of a problem to try to coordinate that. So we have to live with and trust that everybody will be able to pay attention on their end and mute themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Bill Kinter. Thanks, Scott. So I wanted to give you the background of the material that we're going to go over today. So back in June, Debbie, Chris, and I had individual meetings with all nine of the EIS contractors. And these, these meetings went about two hours each. One of the things that we asked the contractors to do was to come to the meeting with a list of those items that they thought had the greatest potential to cause delays in implementations and also any mitigation strategies or steps that they would recommend to try to keep these kind of delays to an absolute minimum. So the content that we're going to go over with you over the next hour and a half or so comes from the EIS contractors. When they submitted these, uh, a lot of the items uh, were common items. Um, depending on, uh, you know, whatever your perspective and background may be, uh, oftentimes they're the exact same things that, that cause these delays. And you will see, you know, a little overlap as we go through these from item to item. But what we'd like you to do today is during this workshop, uh, for you agency personnel, out there, we want you to feel free to chime in, bring up challenges that you've had in the past. You know, tell us your war stories. And we have, as Scott said, you know, a few in the room and many more on the bridge from the EIS contractors. We're all here to try to talk through these, these potential delays. So feel free to share your challenges and get your questions answered. Okay, Scott, next. So we wanted to start out with what we're calling real-world installation intervals. And these are from networks. So we picked several different services, and we went in to the network's data that GSA has. And you can see some of these are a lot of days. And if you look at SLAs in the network's contract, you'd go, well, wow, these are a lot longer than what we see in, in these service level agreements and in the different, you know, published intervals. Well, this is real world stuff. The reason why we wanted to start and show you these intervals is the kind of things we're going to talk about here help contribute to how long it takes you know, to get from order to service order completion notice. And the more that we can shrink these things out under EIS, probably the shorter some of these intervals will be. So if you want to go to the next slide. So as we go through these, the format we've developed, we're going to show you, you know, what the example is. And then we're going to talk about EIS contractor actions and agency actions. So for these intervals, what we would really like the contractors to do is take advantage of this kind of data. You know, these are real world. These aren't some kind of fantasy things. And use this kind of data to help construct realistic implementation plans. You know, it doesn't do any good to have that plan that we've all seen with the line that becomes a big hockey stick and, you know, and then a miracle occurs right at the end. We've all seen those. We know they don't work. So we want realistic implementation plans. And we also are challenging the EIS contractors to 
educate agencies on the risks that can exist between what are in the contract installation SLAs and intervals and actual delivery. We've got a lot of people who know what it takes to actually get things up and running. On the agency side for these real world intervals, you know, we highly, highly recommend you work very closely with the EIS contractor that you award your task order to. Look in the EIS contract and it talks about task order project plans, TOPPs. You should be doing task order project plans for your task orders. And we also recommend that these are formal documents that the agency should sign and also the EIS contractor should sign. You ought to look each other in the eye and have agreement. This is a plan, this is realistic, and this is what we're going to execute against. And then also agencies need to work to mitigate the known risks that are agency responsibilities. Now, a lot of the things we're going to go through here today are things that the agency does control, and so we want to make sure you're working those items. So let's go on to the next one, Scott. So one of the first things that can cause delays that the EIS contractor shared with us is agencies getting their people registered in the contractor business support systems. I think everybody's well aware GSA put all nine EIS contractors, you know, kind of through the ringer and made sure these BSS systems work properly. They had to pass a lot of tests there. And now it's time to start using those. Uh, EIS contractors shared with us there can be a lot of time lost between when that agency makes that task order decision and issues that task order and when users are, you know, can log in and really start using the systems. So EIS contractors, we've asked them at your kickoff meeting right after you award your task order. Have this on your list. Agencies, you need to figure out in advance who should have access to what data in those business support systems. Because the contractors need to know this right up front. Not only do they need to help you get registered, but a lot of our nine EIS contractors have training that's all been developed and is all ready to go on how to use these systems, but you gotta be registered to use the training. For agencies, we really want you to have a sense of urgency in figuring out your personnel who should have access to this information. At this point, let me pause. Do we have any, any of our EIS contractor experts that would like to add a little color commentary here? Nick? Bill, this is Nick with BT Federal. Just to add to that, particularly for the agencies, the use cases within the EIS contract for the BSS are not particularly clear. And so besides registering and appropriate access, what are the roles, the question we, we would like to know, or what are the roles that the, that the agencies see for individuals which governs their access to the information in the BSS? Are they going to be placing orders? Are they just going to be looking at inventory? Are they going to be looking at financial information? Are they just a site point of contact with no other access? So just defining the roles up front of how agency staff will use the BSS, if at all, um, will help to clarify that relationship at the kickoff and help to determine the uh, appropriate access of data. Because one of the clearest requirements of the BSS is role-based access control. So we need to define the role up front uh, when we grant access to a user. Okay. Thanks, Hi. Nick. Hi, uh, Nick, thanks for um, those points. Um, I'd like to add, my name is Andrea Hudson, I'm with uh, AT&T. And uh, AT&T has also, um, I guess, you. established one step further, and that is to, um, for the, the agency to identify one point of contact that will manage those roles and responsibilities, right? Um, the very important the first step is that the, the commercial vendor be received the task order award 
Um, and then the second is to establish your hierarchy, um, architectural hierarchy code structure that is key in, you know, assigning or making sure that this particular or that particular project or program it is um, assigned to that particular, you know, um, project. Uh, the third thing is the customer is responsible, like I said, for naming an individual um, to manage the multi-factor access and your role-based con uh, controls. Okay. Thanks. Uh, this is Jasper from Mattel. Just kind of Captain Obvious. Um, point I was going to make here is that if you haven't done so already, and this is a great time to kind of collect and refresh who can currently make orders in your organization now um, to do that. Um, that's the obvious, I think, kind of step one and to figure out who needs access and if you can get ahead of that um, and, and analyze that. If you don't have it already, uh, definitely want to get to that before, prior to kickoff. Okay, thanks very much for those points. So, so Scott, uh, let's go Kathy on. To Hatley. This is Kathy yep. Hatley from NASA. So not only do we have to do those, define all those roles for the, Conexus, the GSA Connexus system, we have to, to do the same thing for whatever vendor we uh, award to. I, I thought the, the purpose of Connexus was for us to be able to submit orders and to check our billing. So why are we having to do that with the vendors as well? So um, there may be elements of the vendor BSS system that you would be using for that you wouldn't be using going through a Conexus. Uh, you know, the first one that would come to my mind is maybe trouble ticket management or something like that. So, uh, you know, Kathy, I think what you need to do is just, you know, sit down with your your EIS contractor you award your task order to and and walk through and say, hey, you know, here's the functionality we're using in Conexus. You know, you shouldn't have to do it two places if you're if you're uh, using Conexus for ordering or something. But there may be other functionality that you want to tap, and you know, really only your EIS contractor can can sort that out and and tell you what those things would be. Okay, Does that makes sense. Can I add to yeah. that? Uh, this is Andrea with AT&T. Um, so the BSS for uh, AT&T will, you can not only, or you will own, not only be able to track the progress of your report, uh, or your project, I'm sorry, um, but you see things real time, right? Um, you can input or add new business or orders, um, and you can also, um, check your inventory, you can schedule testing, you can um, create manageable reports that you may need, um, as well as view your billing. Yeah, we're so, supposed yeah. to, we, we wanted to do all that as much as possible through Conexus, so that we're getting one thing. So we should be able to view our billing in Conexus. We should be able to view our order status in Conexus. So, I mean, that's what we're paying GSA for. Um, so we're trying to use Conexus as much as possible so that we get standard across the board uh, information back on our task orders. Okay, good. That, thanks for, uh, for sharing that. Okay, uh, the, the next uh, element that we wanted to go over, and by the way, these are in no particular order. We don't have these ranked top to bottom or bottom to top. Uh, you know, they mostly pretty much stand alone. We've tried to group some of these uh, where it made most sense. So the next one is project management. And you may go, well, duh, Bill. <laughs> you know, yeah, we know we have to do this. But here are some of the things the EIS contractors shared with us. Um, and these are really Pretty much lessons from the past. So project scope not being well defined. And this will impact schedules. You, you start to get into the, you know, the heat of your implementation. You're trying to do so many sites, uh, you know, turn up so many sites a week or something. And all of a sudden, 
the agency is going, well, gee, we need you to also do this, this, and this thing over here, too. Um, and that scope creep can just upset any kind of schedule, especially if it's, you know, gotten to the point where it's operating really well and you're clicking off sites on a weekly basis. So want to look carefully for scope not being well defined. Another item, necessary equipment not budgeted for by agencies. We had a few different contractors tell us, you know, they've had projects in the past where they start to get into things. There's equipment that is supposed to be supplied by the agency, and the agency went like, whoops, well, not only did we miss that, but now we have to find the money for that. Uh, third item we had under project management, identifying critical infrastructure and sites that are dependent on other sites to make sure connectivity. You know, in the old days, there was an awful lot of hub-spoke designs and things, but even in today's flatter network designs, just the way you operate, you know, one site may de be dependent on another. You need to know those going in, and you need to make sure you communicate those to your EIS contractor. Next one, agency contractor staffing not available. What we're talking about here is many, many agencies now outsource uh, their operations and their telecommunications to third-party vendors. This can even go as far as like TEMS support where they may be helping you with ordering. Um, it could be your lands are managed by a third-party vendor that you have hired. If you're still using a PBX and dependent on that, PBX maintenance or putting new cards in slots on that could be managed by one of these vendors. You need to make sure they're part of the implementation team and have them on board for the project management and the planning. Uh, next one avoiding in-flight orders when scheduling. So I think it's pretty universal that across tele telecommunications providers, their systems are designed, they can work one order at a time. And you can't have multiple orders trying to hit the same facility, the same port, or whatever at the same time. So you have to be very, very careful about, you know, do you have a change order pending on this site? And then you want to put in a new installation order against that site, they could conflict. So you want to be very, very careful with that. And a lot of that starts with, with inventory and making sure your inventory is good. Okay, now let's go on to what we've, we've seen as the contractor and agency mitigation actions. And these we didn't split into a list for contractor and a list for agency because the more we looked at it, we said, folks, you got to be hand in hand on these when you do these. So number one, of course, and this is pretty much mom and apple pie, upfront planning along with formal agreement on the scope, staffing, roles, and responsibilities. You know, if you look in the EIS contract in G3.3.3.3, you ought to be able to remember that one, um, look in there, that's where it talks about the task order project plan. There's a lot of good information in there to make sure that you hit all the different sections that will serve you well. Because you need to identify, you know, your processes, your staffing, your scheduling, your procedures, tools, implementation of the task order. And for those that have been around for a long time, people know doing this under a task order type scheme is a lot different than the way things were done in the past. So we're looking for those contractors to deliver those task order project plans to the OCO. And as we said, we're recommending those be formally approved and signed, you know, and make sure you have these agreements in place before you start executing. And so let me, with that, that kind of brings us to the end of that section. Let's open it up for some questions. And do we have, well, I don't see any open questions in the Q&A pod. If you have a question, you can type it in, put your name, 
as Scott said in the beginning, if it's a question that popped into your head when you were looking at a certain slide, reference that slide number. We can get to that if need be. But do we have any verbal questions at this time? Bill, I don't have any questions, okay. but I've got a couple of contractor comments, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So I just want to kind of go back you know, a couple slides there. Slide number 10, we talked about some of those in-flight orders. And as we're putting together some of our, our plans, so you know, specifically looking in, into our transition plans, we want to make sure that as we are working, um, you know, the agencies and the contractors working together, we want to make sure that we you know, bring up any transformations or any pending orders that are planned um, that we can go ahead and incorporate that into our transition planning. Um, because as we go and look for that, that transition execution, um, anything that is in flight is going to go and cause a fallout. And then that's going to cause us to go ahead and miss some of those cycles and cause delays for you guys. Um, on top of that, you know, as we're working on transition planning, um, on slide 11 we talk about kind of as our part of our project management function, um, one of the things that's imperative is having accuracy in our inventory. And so we want to make sure it's, uh, you know, it's not a one-sided activity as we're working, you know, agency and contractor to go ahead and work through that inventory, make sure we have 100% agreement on what we're going to go ahead and try to be bringing it over in terms of services, features, equipment, and those configurations. Um, because we want to make sure as we are pull, pulling things across that, you know, everything that's expected to move over from one contract to the other actually does move across because we don't want to orphan any services on those old contracts. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate those comments. Okay, we have a question in the Q&A pod. Let me read it here. Um, this uh, person is saying that their EIS contractor contact stated, and if you can get that off there, uh, GSA has not really explained to us what the process should be when receiving task orders. What am I supposed to do? Actually, I think this would be better. Chad, if you wouldn't mind coming off mute and telling us a little more about what the situation is. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So. <laughs> Um, I've been speaking with, and I hate to name names, but I won't name his name. He's a federal contracts manager for CenturyLink. How about that? And that's verbatim from the email I received from him. That was back in middle of September, and I'm freaking out because here we are getting near the, you know, the finish line for making these transitions, and I've not heard anything from them. And as the little guy on the this end of the phone, I don't know what to do next. And when CenturyLink's telling me that they don't know what GSA or how they're supposed to manage these orders, I have to move somewhere, I have to do something, and I'm stuck. So, uh, What I'd like to do, there. Chad, is um, if you would send me your, send me an email. I'm not going to ask you to tell everyone your email address. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll get in touch with you and work through this specifically. Um, so you can email me at... D E B B I E dot H R E N at G S A dot gov. Is uh do you know who your agency manager or um, technology service rep is? Is it Maureen Edwards by chance? It is, I believe, yes. Let's see here. Hold on. Yes, Maureen. And she's been great. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I thought the, the issue looked familiar. So uh, we, will, we will address that um, with you specifically. Um, for the, the group, when the contractor receives your task order, um, <laughs> that's a, a customer standing with money in hand ready to buy something. So we want to try to make sure that your contractor knows how to take that money and, and sell you something. <laughs> um, so that it should be a, a matter of, providing the task order 
document, which essentially becomes a contract between you and the EIS contractor in a form that conveys what is contractually required or what is required by the FAR, which is what the services are that you're buying and the price that you're going to pay for them and any other requirements for you know delivery, um, delivery times, delivery place, anything like that. And that allows both parties um, providing consent uh, to that contractual agreement to sign that document. So we suggest you use, uh, if you don't already have a task order award form, you can use the GSA Form 30. It is for universal use by federal agencies. And um, it, if that form doesn't work for you, you can, there are other options we can, we can uh, prepare or propose for you. Um, but that, that, something like that should be usable. And when the EIS contractor receives that, uh, it's a standard form that they're used to getting. So it, it may be a matter of the person that um, you're working with is maybe new to this process and to government process. Um, and it's a matter of education there, and we will help through that. But it, um, if you have any questions, if anyone has any questions about um, what sort of form to use for a task order award, you can you can do a Google search for GSA Form 30, and and find that in the forms library and use that. If you need additional assistance, you can always contact us through the help desk on our website gsa.gov/eistransition, or contact your agency manager or technology service manager. Um, that you can also find their names on the, the links on those websites as well. Can you post your email address in the Q&A section there? I don't want to get it wrong. In the Q&A section. I'll do it after this one. Um, oh, yeah, we'll, in the answer to his question. Yeah, we'll do it. Okay, yes. Well, I didn't know if we knew. I don't know how to do that. Mark does. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we, we have another question from uh, Kevin Morgan in the Q&A pod. When does the TOPP take place with a selected contractor? So what you would do once you issue a task order, uh, you know, your, your EIS contractor will, will sign that documentation. And normally the next big step will be a kickoff meeting. And you'll get together and we actually have uh, put out guidance on topics that ought to be covered in kickoff meetings. It is in uh, bulletin number seven if you're an Interact subscriber. And uh, you can go in there and take a look at that bulletin and see what should happen in the kickoff meeting. But once you have the kickoff meeting, you'll start to get organized. You'll start to, to figure out, okay, contractor, you know, how are you going to deliver against this task order we've issued? And that's what the task order project plan is all about. It is that documentation that says, here's how we're going to do it. So once you've had your kickoff meeting or during your kickoff meeting, you ought to be, you know, you shouldn't walk out of the room unless you've scheduled, hey, here's our, our first <laughs> meeting to start saying, how are we going to get this task order project plan together? And depending on what is in your task order, you know, it'll determine how long it'll take you to put that project plan together. Um, you know, good project management teaches you, you know, if you spend a little more time up front, you'll get to the eventual finish line faster. So you don't want to just throw something together, sign it, and say, hey, let's get going. You really want to be thoughtful in it. But it is basically the next major step after you award that task order, have that kickoff meeting. You should start working on putting together that document. But we highly um, advise that something you do together with your EIS contractor. And, and there's a follow-on. Uh, this on, is Kathy um, Hatley. Uh, can I just give a little bit more clarity to that, having been through this? Um, sure. You will issue the task order. You then have to wait for the protest period to end. So there is some time between when you issue the task order and that period, at least it was for NASA. Once you uh, once that protest period had ended, then we scheduled our uh, kickoff meeting, and we took uh, in that kickoff meeting, then we took their uh, 
uh, draft transition plan, which they had to provide to us in their proposal, their draft uh, uh, program, pro project management plan that they had to provide for us in the proposal, and that's what we used to start off. So you're not going to be able to issue your task order and then the very next day have a kickoff meeting, or at least we couldn't in NASA. There is a protest period there that you have to wait uh, to go through for anybody to protest your award. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Kathy. There's a, a as a follow-on to um, the original question for the EIS contractors, how do you typically assign teams to help uh, work with the agencies for that that task order planning? Do you have a project manager, or what kind of setup do you use? We, this is Andrea with uh, AT and T, and we we you know go through our um, our process, our, our staffing rather, um, to see to assign the, the specific uh, task order to an individual manager, and um, they will uh, head up and gather the inventory that we currently have to provide uh, when um, the kickoff call or meeting is scheduled, um, and and go through the the top. Uh, criteria, if you will, um, to provide. So we're going to determine or we're going to discuss things such as, you know, are we transitioning like for like services? Are we going to upgrade your service? Uh, you, are you going to need uh, new equipment? Um, who's going to be responsible for inside wiring? Um, let's see, what else? Uh, So all that will, uh, to me, you know, if you don't to me, it, you should have already done all that in the proposal. Right. That should have already been stated in your proposed uh, design, should it not? At least that's how we did it. We didn't well, have to define I, these responsibilities. It would be defined, but then you're going to go through it with a fine-tooth comb, right? So you're going to actually get down to where, okay, you. In our inventory, we show that this is going to be like for like services. Are you, you know, can you please confirm that this is, you know, what your information shows? Um, you know, maybe there will be upgraded services. Can you confirm that it's going to be this particular speed or bandwidth or this type of services? So you're going to go through that inventory. Um. This is uh, Jasper from Mattel. Um, it, it is correct. Usually, you know, in our in our responses to our proposals, we will designate a PM um, and other people uh, on the team that will be attending to the to the task order. Um, and the only surprise from there, from a kickoff, may be if, depending on you know what what's been awarded or what people are working on, we may swap some names here and there. But yeah, there won't, there shouldn't be any surprises. Should we move on? Yeah. yeah, this is Steve from Verizon. For for our kickoff meetings, uh, within the material that we provide, I'll actually have the full list of the team, including your account team members, your billing account folks, uh, your transition managers, and any escalation paths. Okay, I, I see we, that we do have a couple more questions, but in the interest of time, let's move on and, and we can go back and, and see if we can pick those up later. So uh, with that, let me turn over the next section to my colleague, Chris Hamby. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Good afternoon. I'm going to uh, let Bill give his voice a rest, and we'll move, some, move on to some of these other topics here. Um, the first one being uh, apropos, given what we just talked about, inadequate interbuilding wiring. So um, do you have the right wiring on site? Um, if, for an example, if you want to move to IP phones, et cetera. So a um, couple of things we recommend here from the EIS contractor side of the house, which is uh, communicate those wiring requirements to the agency, should have done, and uh, conduct site surveys if you're still not sure about what's going on. You know, and I'm sure they're all happy to do that. We'd love to be able to do that, because then they get their feet on the ground and can see what's really going on. Um, the agency, um, obviously, site access is a big issue. That's going to be an ongoing theme throughout here. <laughs> Make sure you have people available for uh, to, to escort folks as necessary. Um, probably want to consult with your own internal IT department as well, obviously, um, to see um, if there's any infrastructure information they need or they have that would be uh, beneficial to the contractor. And then 
The other one here is if you're in a, a GSA PBS building, public building service, um, definitely give them a call, coordinate with them. Um, I know we released a bulletin, um, the last bulletin we released, right? Bulletin yeah. 8 had uh, contacts for PBS in it. I think that was it. And we're about to release a new one in bulletin 9 that lists all the services on, on EIS and uh, proposed action, uh, interaction with PBS. So, hey, if you're implementing X service, definitely want to call PBS for these issues if you plan on doing it and you have a PBS building. This carries over not just with PBS, you want to talk to the building owner as well and have them involved because you're going to be stepping into other areas. You may need access to closets, other things, you know, so um, so the agency be ready for that. That's one of the things that can cause um, some delays. If, uh, the contractor does not have access to what they need to, to see to validate that wiring, um, you know, that's, a, that's one. All right. Um, I think let's go ahead on to the next one then. Related to that, similarly, uh, inaccurate or limited information. So um, the example we have here is uh, incorrect order information. Um, you know, um, maybe you're missing something, um, et cetera. It can cause uh, a change to the order or a cancellation of the order or a reissue of the order. And obviously all those things indicate time lost and time that's spent, cycles that are spent that have to be reworked. So um, what did the EIS contractors talk about with us? They talked about, uh, some of them have talked about providing a SME for technical review and to validate the data. You know, I'm sure they're happy to do that. They love to because it eases stuff up on their end. So, um, and some have offered uh, to help with service rate, service order rating, uh, you know, as well. So uh, they know what needs to be in the order and they can make sure it's all there before it goes forward, right? Um, so from the agency side, um, we're going to hit that inventory thing again. So perform an inventory review with your contractor um, uh, to make sure that you have all the information you need to fill out those orders. You know, that's part of that inventory review. You know, we did a training session or a workshop uh, months, a few months ago on uh, transition inventory assurance. And uh, one subcomponent of that is making sure you have the right information for all your current inventory, the information that needs, to, especially if you're doing a like for like. If you're not, you know, still having that info helps. So also, um, we would stress to the agencies, if the contractor comes back and needs info, is missing info, respond as fast as possible if you can, um, because that will uh, mitigate any potential cancellations or other things. Um, probably want to designate a single point of contact or something that they can uh, work through to uh, get that information updated properly. So. Um, the this is Nick, Nick from BT Federal, and I'm sure my my colleagues from the other vendors will have. I see them smiling across the table. <laughs> this is the single largest thing <laughs> that you can do to keep your project running when it comes to ordering phones, circuits connections, internet, MPLS, any of those infrastructure items. <laughs> I have seen on the commercial side, I come from our commercial side in British Telecom, I have seen it on the government side. This is it. A single zip code that's wrong will cause the, can cause the entire order to get burped. <laughs> and, that, and every vendor has very error intolerant systems to these sorts of things. Every one of us does. It's not a BT or an AT&T or Verizon thing. Once that order goes into the factory, lots of people touch it, and they assume the information is 100% accurate down to every digit. So when there's a building number or a building name that's somehow wrong and a workman gets confused, he or she goes back to the supervisor and says, I don't know where I'm going to take this. You cancel the order, you're started over again. So please location data, point of contact data with honest to God people who were there who can really answer the phone, uh, the floor, the cage, the room, all that. I'll turn it over to my AT&T colleague who's been nodding her head. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Um, the, the, so what we try to do also when we're having these meetings with the agencies or the, um, uh, the uh, with the agencies, we want to offer our services as to helping you um, write your orders. You know, if you're, if you're purchasing or up
upgrading um, your services, there are certain key factors that we need to in, include in our orders. So that if, you know, four wire, two wire, optical, electrical, um, those types of things will impact the order and, you know, if, it's not, if it doesn't match or if it's, if it's um, incorrect and we don't find out until after it's installed, we've got to start all over again. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, every uh, vendor will help yeah. you write your orders. Yeah. Yes. Did you have you on it? I was going to, I mean, inventory validation, if you haven't done it yet, um, do it now. Uh, someone, the first gentleman on the earlier question, first question, uh, he sounded like his inventory was very detailed and important. So if that's the case, I would strongly encourage, if you're still working on transition, if you're still working on task orders, to make it walk and talk like the inventory you have now, include everything. Okay? Can I just add one more thing? Yeah, please. Um, so if you're dealing with military bases, um, you know, they're always being, the LCOMs are being deployed, they could be deployed. So you need to, when you send over those task orders, please ensure that the, you know, LCON is current, is alive, is, um, you know, still <laughs> at that, Death. Right. That subject's so important, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. It has yeah. its own slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So let's go ahead and move Hi. on. Hi. This yep. is Stephanie with Granite. Um, so I just oh, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. wanted to go, go back to the inventory thing for one minute. Um, so we one time had a order for to move several PRIs onto a SIP trunk. Um, and there was a bunch of unused numbers that we weren't told about. So. Even, just keep in mind, even if you're not using the numbers anymore, we still need to know about those so that we can make sure your orders get through as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Um, and then we were also on that same order provided the wrong routing information. So just make sure you verify all that stuff ahead of time so that way we can get it done as fast as possible. Okay. Nice example. Yeah. Yeah. And so, this is Robert Jenkins from Harris. Can I just, ahead, Robert. I just want to throw out that? Yep. Sometimes when we're, we're trying to validate um, buildings and addresses, the, the, the address is different from the, the building, and a lot of times, like an aerial view of it will help us when we're trying to get it validated with the actual telco itself. So we, we, we may need that circle on, you know, like Google Maps or something like that that'll help us with honing in on where that address is. It's, okay. It, it, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And actually, that brings me right into the next slide, which is address validation. So <laughs> obviously an error, That's right? Make good. sure the address. Okay. Right. So, um, you know, address validation discrepancies are a problem. Uh, access providers 911 database, you know, may not match what the address provided by the agency, et cetera. That's just one example. You know, um, there are many here. So the contractors have uh, uh, one of their actions is provide urgent coordination between the access provider and the agency. Um, I would just say coordination between, <laughs> between them. Um, but what can the agency do? Um, one of the things we say is, again, back to that inventory, examine that data, such as prior billing, you know, um, on your existing services for alternatives to the address. You know, um, they, they find out quite often, if you go back and look at your old bills, that it's something subtly different than what you know the address as. And that address on your bill is actually the address the, the telecom provider is actually knows it as you know, in their systems, et cetera. So that's a great source to go back to, to see that. And it happens quite a bit. Um, you know it is building X and it's building Y on the, on the system or X.1. So it certainly um, helps out a lot. Is, this is Kathy Hatley again. Are you um, suggesting these changes to help during the transition phase? Yes. 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 Okay, because... Um, you're not going to get accurate building if you don't have the correct address, and we've found that out. So yeah. a lot of these things have been done before we issue the task order, or we've even had the uh, uh, vendors come back after we've issued the task order and say that some of our information and in our pricing sheets is incorrect for them in order to bill correctly. So a lot of this should be done prior to your task order being issued or your, your RFP being issued, um, I would think that 
after you've awarded the task order, you shouldn't have any address issues because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to give you the correct billing. That's true. The, the, an address validation is an ongoing activity, I think is the way to yeah. Yeah. summarize yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, Sorry, really quick. If there's agencies on the call that are not entirely competent in their inventory, um, there are a couple um, resources that GSA has for their transition inventory and their all agency inventory um, that are ready and available for every agency. So if you don't know, uh, please reach out. And it's a great starting point and it's a great point to utilize in your ongoing inventory reconciliation. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, the next one, which is uh, OCONUS installations. Um, moving a little bit on the field now. Obviously, um, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious that any installations outside the continental United States um, will have the, uh, you'll certainly carry the risk that they could take longer, depending on what has to happen. Uh, you know, um, requirements are different, et cetera. So um, we, the EIS contractors have talked about um, assigning specific project managers to OCONIS activities. Um, you know, uh, they may have special knowledge, et cetera, for those different areas. That's one thing they can do to help out. What the agencies can do is, and we talked about this in transition order sequencing workshop we had, put those orders early. Make those an early part of your plan, right, your transition plan. Get those started soon rather than later. Um, yeah, and uh, um, be open to assisting EIS contractors with uh, equipment delivery if that's the case. There's often an issue if equipment needs to go out there. Uh, you know, you can certainly help them out by uh, knowing the known custom issues, et cetera, if they exist. Um, and if you have a subject matter expert at the agency with those OCONUS areas, you know, make sure they get involved. I know that seems pretty obvious, but, you know, these are, these are, are what we think. And the other one that uh, to make sure is understand, too, you know, you're dealing with a different group now, so a little realism is needed to understand what it really takes and the time it might take to get these installations or implementations completed in OCONUS. So, um, all right. So that brings us to the next break here for questions. But in the interest of time, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and keep pushing forward with the next few uh, issues. And I'll turn it back over to Bill. Okay, thanks. So let me walk through the, the next set of, of items. Um, the next one we have is access controls. Uh, after 9-11, <laughs> the world changed in many ways, and this is one of them that affects something like our EIS transition. So site access. Um, and, you know, as, as Kathy said, you know, it, this is the kind of thing that you should be working all the time anyway, but um, special focus when you're trying to get an implementation project done. So look for advanced personnel data, clearances, time of day restrictions, pre-approvals, all those kind of things. Uh, almost every building now has some kind of unique access requirements and treat each building as unique because it's different. We have, you know, um, we have civilian agencies that are on military bases. We have military installations that are in civilian buildings now. Um, it, it can be all over the place. So we ask EIS contractors, you know, know who your cleared technicians are. Many of them have technicians who know those sites better than you do, <laughs> better than we do. Um, and, you know, make sure you know what credentials your technicians have. Um, another one, uh, this is a personal experience of mine, assure personnel are willing to provide personal data and surrender identification. Many buildings, campuses, military bases require you to surrender a driver's license or some kind of ID, and they're going to keep it until you exit their facility. Um, we do know that, that there are technicians who will refuse to do that. You need to figure that out in advance before people show up. Uh, certain technicians represented by unions have union rules relating to these things. You need to check those kind of things out. So that's on the contractor side. On the agency side, 
know the, and we underline this, exact requirements for a site. Um, make sure you know exactly what you have to submit and when you have to submit it. You know, sometimes it's five days in advance or whatever. So pay special attention to access controls. The next topic we have, historic building and hazardous materials. Many, many different government agencies are in historic or special buildings. Uh, also, there are many, many old buildings that we have. Uh, one thing I want to caution against, you know, when you hear the word asbestos, many people immediately think, oh, you know, now we got to get the team in the hazmat suits to come out. This is where you need to work with your building owner. If it's public building service, you need to work with them. Many times you can just route things around an effective area and you don't need to touch any kind of hazardous materials. But you need to look at these things. You need to look at your inventory of buildings, especially when you're doing wiring work. So, so what can agencies do? Here, I'm going to read this one word for word. Provide the correct person who can execute the right of entry or letter of authorization to perform work in historic and older buildings. That wording came directly from a subcontractor that you know many of the agents or the many of the EIS contractors use. There's certain documentation that has to be signed off on before you can work in historic areas. And you need to know who those people are. And this is the kind of thing, it might take you six weeks to figure this out. So you want to know these things in advance. Next one. Select facility capacity and availability. We could probably do a whole workshop on this topic. Um, needless to say, capacity for telecommunication services gets assigned when there's an active order, okay? There's no reservation system. It is first come, first serve, okay? So you need to understand that facilities do get depleted, and it could be by your brother or sister government agency who's down the hall from you. But when the cable is full and fully utilized, the cable is full and another one has to be pulled in. So you need to plan for this. And a lot of this comes in you just need to have flexibility in scheduling your sites. So you know, if you hit one of these situations, gee, let's move some other sites up and we'll move this one back. So for EIS contractors, we're asking them to communicate capacity issues as soon as they find them out. But like I said, they oftentimes will not know it until an active order actually goes and is going through provisioning systems with companies. For the agencies, you need to understand that you are likely to hit this situation. So you need to know how to react to it, okay? So make sure, as I said, flexibility in your scheduling is probably one of the best ways to mitigate that. And then kind of you know, a follow-on topic to capacity and availability is special construction. What happens when there actually has to be physical construction done in order to bring in new capacity, okay? This can have huge impacts on your implementation schedule. Anytime you have to do permitting or digging or whatever, you're talking delays. So for EIS contractors, we ask them to work with the agency at the project start to try to figure out what locations may have these situations. And also, and, and I'll, I'll say this to agencies, agencies, you know, look your task order awardee in the eye and say, what alternatives do you have? A lot of times there are alternatives that they can do. There's, you know, I've seen short, uh, span microwave shots that are done, you get satellite things that are done, uh, 5G is starting to come on board, that might be an option, but also make sure you look at different alternatives that might be available. And, you know, for the agency, again, 
flexibility to rearrange your scheduling, and also if this special construction is something that you have to pay for, timely payment of these things will help keep you on schedule. I've seen projects where a site is delayed six months while the agency is trying to come up with funding to do some kind of special construction. And this will especially hit in things like campus environments. All the ground is owned by the government. It's a government issue. And, but you may need to be paying somebody to come ditch along by the sidewalk. So you need to be thinking about, is there a cost, and do we have funding to cover this? One aspect of that might also be um, historic or, or buildings that, for some reason, are uh, nobody wants to dig up there. Um, we have some courthouses that are stunningly beautiful, and um, I imagine there are some challenges with that. I think uh, we have Bill Presapino on the line who has some experience with courthouses. Maybe you can share some thoughts there. Sure. So, good afternoon. My name is Philip Prestopino, and I'm on the local service side of PSA, and I'm the guy on the ground that uh, works local services uh, for years with GSA. So, in my experience, we've had uh, many difficulties with both uh, historic sites and courthouses. Now, many of you may say, well, we're not justice or judicial, but GSA houses many agencies in the courthouses around the country. So, Many of you may have uh, facilities or sites that are within courthouses, and the access and, and construction in courthouses is extremely difficult. I'll, I'll cover access first. So with respect to access, uh, courthouses are one of the most secure facilities in all the federal government. I'm sure you're all aware of that. But I have had many, many difficulties with getting access both on the local LEC side and uh, the, the, the long-haul carriers. So keep in mind that you've got to work closely with the marshal service to get access into courthouses. Construction in courthouses is another thing. So judges pretty much own courthouses. And if there's cases going on in a courthouse, especially some high-profile cases, they will shut down all construction in courthouses. You need to be well, work with your GSA building managers very, very closely on managing these situations and, and uh, working with them to get access and, and do construction in, in uh, federal courthouses. Now, I, I want to talk about um, uh, historic sites. So I've had construction scheduled in historic sites, and there are councils that convene to discuss these sorts of things. If you're working in a historic location, I'll take Baltimore for an example, uh, Francis Scott Key, uh, a historic site, and Verizon needed to go in there to, to deliver some fiber on a, on a construction project. It took months to get this project approved through this council that looks at every single detail of every single construction project to make sure that it doesn't affect the historic site. These are things that none of us can get around. They are mandated so by law. So keep these things in mind, not to be Debbie Downer, but planning, planning, planning with respect to construction in courthouses and historic sites. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Can I add a couple of points? This is Andrea okay. So we, we do, um, work with a lot of military bases, both on the civilian side of government. And when there is a special construction um, that's needed, uh, none of the carriers or most of the contractors um, are not able to provide or perform that special construction. The bases handle it themselves. Um, so we can get, and there's only like, but depending on the, the, how big the base is, um, there is one, there may be one or two commercial telecom D marks. That's where your access is going to be delivered, but getting it to those agencies across the base is, is primarily on um, the base's uh, 
dime or you know they're they're, they're responsible for that and you have to be aware of who on that base duum or neck um, is responsible for doing those or providing those cross connects and you have to um, supply or, or provide a work order that would not come from the contractor that would come from the end user there on that, that location. Also with special construction with your local access providers, we are not able to expedite that work. And all I'll say is follow on to that. God help you if it's one of the joint bases, because sometimes <laughs> you, 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 might, yeah, you might hit three different entities just trying to get across that base. OK, Chris, anything else on that set of topics? Not for me. OK, let's go on then. All right, um, so uh, let's move on to, related to what we've been talking about, site readiness. Um, so access providers won't start access construction until uh, the premises is certified site ready by their engineer. So, um, or an access provider engineer uh, will conduct a site survey and provide readiness requirements prior to. So it's important that we make sure this goes as smooth as possible. So from the EIS contractor perspective, you um, need to understand from the agency the expected time frame to complete readiness requirements, right? Um, and factor this into the delivery schedule. So again, this is part of project planning up front. Have an idea how long this is going to take. So build it in. What can the agency do? Um, if you're responsible for site readiness stuff, try to complete it as fast as possible. That's uh, obvious, right? <laughs> but uh, um, And confirm it with the contractor when it's done. Um, plan transition based on a rate of monthly site turn up versus a strict site-based schedule. So this is, I think Bill alluded to this earlier, where we kind of talked about um, if you can, if you have a lot of sites you have to do, try to do something along, we, we recommend something with a uh, um, sites per month idea rather than specific sites in a given order. You may have to, we get that, but if you can go that route, then if one hits a snag, the contractor can move to a different one and start turning that one up. So you stay on schedule, you know, to get your stuff done on time. So um, just be, be flexible, that's pretty much what we said. And just as we've said with everything, that, you know, coordinate with PBS or the <laughs> yeah. building owners, you know, when, uh, you know, if you know, if you know you're going to have to do something like that. So, uh, Robert, Duncan, you had yeah, said you wanted I'm, to talk. I'm here. Yeah. Yep, yep, I'm, I'm here. So, I was just, um, to, about this stuff, we, we've we been through uh, a, a lot of site uh, readiness in the past uh, two years, and we ha we're the ones that actually contract it with um, with the state government that we've been on the contract that I'm working on. And uh, what I have found is when we don't find out about it until um, after the first site walkout, and that's when we, you know, like the BIC goes out there and they, they provide what the survey is and then exactly what they need. So a lot of times we don't even know about it. And I either do the, uh, the LCONs, understand if there's any issues or not. Um, beforehand, um, and then we contract to get that done using, you know, someone who's, you know, got ex experienced vendors, they're used to, they know the the sites or they're familiar with the customer and so on, and then uh, what we do is we get the schedule and we find out when they're going to finish, and then we re-engage the, the LEC or we try to get them re-engaged very shortly after that's done. So to try and not miss deadlines and such. So if we know that they're going to be done on November 15th, I might re-engage the LEC now and say, hey, get your guys scheduled because we're going to be done by the 15th. So it's just kind of throwing that out there. Um, and then I view site readiness as from the property line to the EMPO, and then obviously there's inside um, the DMARC area where there's space, backboard, power, and ground. So I, I view that those two things were always considered site readiness for me. So I just want to throw that out there. And and some of that property line to the EMPO, minimum point of entry, um, that can be time consuming as well because it could deal with boring, going onto parking lots and right, right. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Robert. 
All right, let's move on to the next one. This was a big topic we've already hit, but we'll bring it back again. LCONs, the agency local contact. Um, you need to have a knowledgeable and available technical resource at the agency site to avoid a customer not ready classification. If somebody's not there that allows them to do something, then uh, you will, you know, then turned away and you'll have to go back to the beginning of the line again, for lack of a better term. So what can we do? So the EIS contractors, a couple of them suggested they'd actually start to establish some sort of transition working group with the agency, basically a small group that gets together and, dis and, make sh and is responsible for making sure that LCONs are identified and available and ready to go beforehand and then, re and then confirmed again right before you're about to have any activity at that site. I think Andrea brought it up earlier, you know, you, you may have it at the start of the project, but you need to confirm it again later on because especially with anything related to the military, et cetera, they may be deployed or they may have gone somewhere else, et cetera. So keep that up. Um, let's keep going. So actually, can I just throw out one thing too, is one thing that we found with LCOMS is, and someone mentioned it earlier, is, you know, making sure that that person is, is still valid, even from being alive is, right. is, is a big deal too. Point. But, right. but the other thing, too, is making sure they're aware of the project, too. We've gotten into situations where the Elcon had no clue what was going on um, because it was done at a higher level. And while they're the, the Elcon, the person at the, you know, the top of the food chain is making decisions for them that they're not even aware of. So that would be, that helps mitigate some you know, time wasted or confusion and so on and turning away the vendor just to come back another, you know, week later. Right, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, Elcom, we're talking about the same thing as a site POC that you may have identified earlier on. So the same people we're talking about, or can be the same person. So. And this, this is Nick. The, and the site POC is a specific data entry in the BSS, which is required. So last name, first name, uh, mobile number, work number, uh, email address for both a primary and secondary site point of contact. And that's how it's labeled in the BSS. It's not able, labeled right. as an LCON, which is the standard terminology. So that, that data is required in any order, and that gets back to what we talked about before. That's part of a complete set of data around an order is accurate uh, uh, point of contact slash LCON information. Okay. okay. Thank you. On that, so, so. so um, what can the agency do? Um, is uh, and Nick just mentioned both a primary and backup Elcon, right? Or site POC for all of those sites. Also recommend periodically checking those, making sure they're still up to date, especially for any long-term implementation project, right? You may have put it in, and we're a year and a half later, people have changed, so we need to check it again. Um, and hopefully, if those people aren't, but hopefully they are knowledgeable about the location's infrastructure and the services being implemented. So I'll um, make sure it's the right person at the site. So um, provide personnel that are available, right, um, for surveys or wiring, etc. So, um, you know, uh, it, in case it has to be off hours, we need to make sure you, you've identified that, you know. Um, and they take leave. <laughs> right, exactly. That's a good point. I mean, these are all little things, but they add up, you know. Um, so. Um, and as we said, so uh, agencies need to clearly communicate critical dates and objectives to those local contacts. Uh, we recommend at least 10 business days prior, i.e., make sure they're not on leave. <laughs> know somebody's coming out, et cetera, if you can. So, all right. Can I also yeah, add, go ahead, Andrea, Andrea. with AT&T. Um, yeah, so another issue we've had is um, the LEC will contact the ELCON, and they can't give them a specific window or specific time we will be out there. Um, so, I mean, we've gotten calls before where they said, well, can you tell me if they're going to be, it's going to be in the morning or the afternoon? We just get from 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. is when they're going to dispatch or come to your location um, because they also have to, that technician also has to care for service re restoration. So they could be called away. They may not make it to your um, customer site on that day because of that issue. But I can't, 
the contractor isn't able to provide a specific time frame when the local access provider will be out there. Thank you. Um, for NASA, that's not acceptable. So I'll just, I'll just let y'all know that up front. If y'all say you're coming, you need to come. Because we, we, uh, we have to have an activity. When we plan our activities, we notify our customers of our activities. And if you don't show up and the activity doesn't occur, then we have to, it's, it's more than just we'll come back the next day. So uh, for us, that's not acceptable. And of course, that would be a great topic to have, a great conversation to have during your kickoff meeting and when you're doing your transition planning. Yep. Okay. So move on to the next topic, which is building and wire installation. We've talked about this a little bit already. Um, example here is circuit extension from the uh, MPO or minimum point of entry to the room location required by the customer. Um, the contractor, uh, you can offer inside wiring services as part of your work if you want to. Um, uh, you know. <laughs> what does the agency need to do here? Um, they need to understand that the MPO is determined by the building owner, so they decide where that is. You know, so you need to be ready or, or understand where that is. Decide prior to order placement how um, your DMARC extensions will be provided. Um, so on a building by building basis or other, right? Um, the installer can be uh, a customer wiring vendor, customer's wiring vendor dictated by the building owner or an EIS contractor. So there are options to figure out who, can, who that can be and be ready to, to understand who that will be. And again, as usual, coordinate with the building owner, coordinate with BVS. You know, um, you're, you need to work with the building owners when you're doing changes to the building. Wiring's changing to the building. So, a lot of cases. So, all right, let's, so that's, let's move on. So that's it for that section. I'll turn it back over to Bill. Did we have any questions in the, in the pod? Okay. Let me go through what will be the last set of issues that the EIS contractor shared with us. These um, starting off relating with equipment. So um, one thing that uh, that has been seen, and, and I know this was brought up by multiple contractors, was um, current systems that are unable to accommodate new equipment. So you need to make sure that you have technical people who are checking out. If, if you are interfacing with new services, make sure what those services are interfacing with. Can You can plug it in. You can accept it, that it will work. So this is making sure you bring in the right technical people. Um, another issue that's you know in the news a lot these days, hardware supply chain delays. Um, depending on where your your you know equipment may be coming from, um, yeah, I'll give you an example. There can be a strike in Long Beach, California, and your equipment may be sitting there on a ship <laughs> anchored offshore, and you're not going to get that thing unloaded for a while. These kind of issues will affect delivery and can affect your project. Um, so what did we ask contractors to do? Provide subject matter experts for technical review and validation of specific data. And this even goes back to when we talked about validating orders. You want to make sure you validate the technical aspects of an order to make sure that things will work. And if you are interfacing, as I set up above with you know, current equipment that's already there, make sure you've had some technical subject matter expert has checked that out. Um, contractors will warehouse equipment to overcome issues like, gee, sorry, your equipment's sitting on the ship offshore. And wherever possible, you know, talk with your EIS contractor. Do they have agreements with multiple suppliers? And most everybody does. So there are ways to mitigate that. For the agency, Look to perform an inventory review with your EIS contractor to assure that any new equipment will work with any existing equipment that you have. This especially, you know, is important when you're starting to get into a lot of the voice equipment. Provide accurate bill of materials with the task order. 
Uh, if it wasn't part of the task order, you know, make sure you discuss that at the kickoff meeting. Um, you will need to prioritize installation schedules based on equipment delivery at times. Take that into account. And especially a big issue with this transition is determine if you have end-of-life equipment and how you need to deal with that. So check your inventory, check with your suppliers. See if you have equipment that is end of life. Talk with your EIS contractor about things that you can do with that. If you want to go to the next topic, death set equipment installations. So yes, people are still installing desk equipment. <laughs> um, simple things, lack of space for new desk assembly or old desk set storage prior to it being disposed. And with all the security requirements these days, there may be issues with having to make sure equipment is scrubbed of any information or data before it can leave your premises. Take space to pile this stuff up. You need to think about that. So if you are replacing equipment, Talk with your EIS contractor. Try to figure out you know, what the volume is, what space is needed. Again, go back to your landlord, PBS, whoever. Uh, need to figure out space issues with equipment. Next topic, voice system technical information. Okay. Specific information that's required to program new equipment. Um, we all know, you know, if this isn't handled properly, your end users will hunt you down, they will find you, okay? Configuration issues, you know, can be a nightmare. So we're looking for EIS contractors to communicate the technical requirements to the agency. You've got to make sure you take care of all these things. And again, provide technical experts to advise your agency. Hopefully, Agencies put some of these kind of requirements in their solicitations so that these things can be drafted and EIS contractors can tell you in their proposal, here's how we deal with these issues. So that, that is a good thing. Nick, did you have something you wanted to add? Right. I, I've done, I've overseen a lot of voice over IP at government and commercial uh, installations uh, throughout my career. and. This technical information, if you're doing voice, can slow you down if you're not expecting to have to deliver it. And if, if you then only after the fact require that the contractor come and collect it and interview hundreds and hundreds of people and comb through your records. So this is actually something that's very important during the solicitation to define the level of information you feel you can give your IP voice uh, vendor versus if you don't know what you need your IP voice vendor to go find out. Uh, interactive voice response and call tree data can take hours and hours for each item to investigate. Th these are the things like press one for cardiology, press two for the pharmacy, that kind of thing. If you're a voice-centric agency that makes a lot of use of voice for citizen services, you need to pay attention to what it will take to to uh, determine what you have and rebuild it in the new system to provide good citizen services. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Next topic, missed deliveries. Okay. A couple examples of those. Uh, lack access, delayed delivery. Yeah, you get that clock date. Do you expect them to show up at that time? Date comes and goes, <laughs> no installation. Uh, I think pretty much everybody has been there at one time or another. Um, and just the EIS contractor failing to deliver on, on the scheduled date. So we look to the EIS contractors, what can they do to mitigate this? You know, especially when a, miss, a delivery is missed, determine the cause for the missed delivery. Um, Sad to say, a lot of times it goes back to one or more of these topics we've been discussing over the last hour and a half, okay? And then coordinating a reschedule. Again, we've kind of talked about this a little bit as we've gone through, but on the agency side, 
think very, very seriously about planning transitions based on a rate of site turnups, you know, per week or per month or something versus a strict site-by-site -site schedule. You will need to take some sites and move them down based on issues, and you may have sites that then you can move up. So, uh, you know, personally I've done a lot of installations, and I found, you know, this system works the best. You know, have a bogey, five sites a week. You know, I actually did one project for the Postal Service, 50 turnups a week, okay? And that was rewiring post offices. And if you want to talk nightmares, you can buy me a beer and I'll tell you all about that sometime. <laughs> but the important thing is here on misdelivery, you've got to account for it because it will happen in any project with any number of sites. And it's how you react to it that determines if you keep on schedule or not. And then the last topic we have to bring up is local number portability. Now, we have done an entire workshop on this, and actually it was so popular we repeated it and had a lot of people in the second session too. Um, what I want to say on this is if you go on GSAZIS transition webpage under resources, you will see the full service transition plan uh, in the back of that plan, there is a whole section on local number portability, and we are going to be working on revising that plan because from our two workshops, we actually gained some additional information, so we want to, uh, to update some of that data, but it will give you a good feel for local number portability and what it is all about, and uh, there's an awful lot of data available. So before we open it up for, for questions, you know, I just want to refer you back to that opening slide that had those real-world intervals for different services. And you probably looked at it at the beginning and said, wow, that seems like an awful long time. And now that we've gone through all these, you might be saying, wow, that looks pretty good if we could get it in by that time. Because these are all the type of issues, not only that you can hit, but that you likely will hit. So you want to plan for them and work very, very closely with your EIS contractor. So now that I've got you a little bit on ahead of schedule here, let's open it up. If you have questions, please, you know, you can type them into the Q&A pod, and uh, we will open it up for any verbal questions or other issues you have, as we said. We've got a lot of EIS contractor expertise in the room and on the bridge, and this is your chance to get your questions answered. This is Kathy Hatley from NASA. I just have a request. Um, we put a lot of work into our uh, RFPs, uh, specifically our service level agreements and what we expect our services uh, to perform at, and it would just be helpful from our viewpoint if a contractor, EIS contractor, cannot meet those SLAs, then don't submit a proposal. I, I may be going out on a limb here in procurement world, but it's just, it's really kind of a waste of time for you putting together your proposal and for us having to review a proposal that will not meet our SLAs. And um, we are obligated, if we receive a proposal, to do a full review on it. And so it's just, uh, it would be helpful if you would carefully look at the RFP, look at the agency's SLAs and what they have requested, and they may be different from the EIS SLAs, and we understand that they are different. But if you can't meet those SLAs, it would be better if you just did not propose. So noted. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Good point. Any anybody else who has the next question? This is Bernard Watts from. Uh,
from DOE. Is there going to be by chance a transcript of of this? I, I had problems uh, logging into the webinar itself, so I, I called in. So there's some information that I, I didn't ha I didn't have access to through the webinar. So Bernard, the, the short answer is yes. We've recorded this, and it'll eventually be made available once it gets through all the process and approval and it will be posted out on the GSA Interact website. In the meantime, what you, each registered participant will receive also is a copy of the presentation in email. If you weren't able to log in today and download a copy for yourself, uh, everybody will get another copy just, just to make sure we cover every base and that you actually get one, you get your hands on one. So uh, yes, there will be a recording. It will be available and we'll give you the, a copy uh, following the today's presentation in email. Uh, thanks very much. So um, yeah, this is Bill. One, one thing I would encourage you, you know, some agencies like, like NASA and like Kathy has shared, um, you know, are very prescriptive in their solicitations about, you know, here's what our contractors need to do. Uh, here's what we need to you know, you need to perform at a certain level, you know, to serve us properly. Other agencies, you know, are not so prescriptive, but once you remember, all these things we've talked about have come from the EIS contractors and their past experience. So I would strongly encourage you to, you know, make sure you download this, as Scott explained how to do, or, or get a hold of this, and, you know, Keep a copy of this handy because these are the kind of issues you want to talk with your EIS contractor, you know, either maybe before you make the task order award uh, would be good, uh, but, but certainly after on how you can mitigate these things because these are all real world examples. I think personally in my career I experienced every single thing that is in this deck and you are likely to run into these things too. And, you know, if you have a large project, you know, we have agencies that have, you know, up to 5,000 sites they're looking to, to transition. Um, you will hit these issues, and as I said, it's not so much hitting the issue, it's how you react to it, how your contractor reacts to it, that determines are you going to get this transition done on time or not. Okay. Um, hey, hey, Philip, you wanted to make a comment? Please do. Yes, if I could. Again, this is Philip Prestopino with the GSA, full service side of GSA. And I just want to make a comment about um, some things I've seen recently with respect to agencies and, and their voice transitions and conversations I've had with, uh, with uh, some of my agencies. So, for many years, GSA full service has managed your voice communication. And we've managed it pretty much soup to nuts uh, with respect to sites all over the country. So I would just, some of the things I would encourage you to consider as you start your projects, um, and, and uh, they are really come down to roles and responsibilities. So they covered inside wiring. I cannot tell you how important it is to, to manage inside wiring issues before they happen. Know from your site surveys what inside wiring requirements you have and work with your EIS vendor to determine how those uh, solutions are going to be managed. Uh, power. Power is always a, excuse me, a very difficult issue to manage. And remember, you're going to have to run concurrent systems in many cases. And so the power requirements initially are going to be very big, uh, obviously that will change after you remove the old equipment, but initially you're going to have to manage power requirements and it is going to become a problem. I've been in many, many DMARCs, uh, in many DMARCs in many buildings uh, around GSA and I can tell you power is always a struggle. Um, and then third thing, understand um, your who's going to do what. So I reviewed a project recently where a customer was was uh, having new phones put in, and they didn't include in their statement of work who was going to actually put in the phone. So the vendor 
wasn't didn't have it in their responsibilities to install their phones. And of course, the, the customer, they don't have folks out in the field typically to do this type of work. So uh, it, the, the work ended up uh, having to hire an outside contractor. So details are important. Uh, remember the things that GSA Local Service has done for you for many, many years. Uh, these, these responsibilities now will be with the agencies. So uh, put it in your statements to work. Work it out in your, in your kickoff meetings and cover all of your details uh, um, because these are now details that are fully, um, you know, going to be required by the agency or the EIS member. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to second what uh, what Philip said about roles and responsibilities. Um, just to uh, to show you when you don't do it right, a couple months ago somebody sent me an inspector general report for an agency that was doing a VoIP transition. And, uh, you know, a lot of the problems they had boiled down to they had multiple contractors, a lot of these third-party contractors for things that we talked about. The roles and responsibilities weren't clear, and it just turned into a festival of finger-pointing. And, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is have an inspector general <laughs> report for your agency, you know, on a, a telecommunications implementation. So, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but, you know, I, I so heartily second what, what Philip was just saying, because you need to work these things out to make sure that everybody knows what to do in order to have a successful implementation. And this is Nick with BT Federal, along the lines of the lack of full service, for the, and we, I think this may have been covered in an earlier workshop, and I think the gentleman who was on said, well, there was no, nobody deploying the phones. That what people don't understand that is if you're doing an I, a voice telephony, you need to have not only that, but we mentioned earlier space for phone removal, but also who's going to do your help desk for those for during that trans, that key transition period, the first couple of days of the cutover. Do you want people to do walk around support and t you know touch people and say how how's your phone operating? Do you like it? Can I help you? Do you want to have a, a, a short help desk? for people to call in and say, my phone's not working right, it's not what I expect or I need help. Those are things that are not in the EIS CLIN for IP voice. And so those are services that need to be defined in your RFP so that your vendors can all have the same set of scope of work to which to bid. Training, no training, deployment, no deployment, all of those services beyond the basic uh, what's listed in the EIS contract. And that goes back to that very early thing we had about well-defined scope and scope creep. So all these, all these elements will come together. Do we have any other questions or any other statements or things to share? Okay, well, turn it back to, uh, to Debbie here to, uh, to conclude for us. All right, thanks, Bill. I'll, I'll bring it back up to um, the overall schedule that we talked about at the beginning. This is, uh, as I said, the, the acquisition phase of this transition should have been over. It's not. Um, so we have to make up that time somewhere, and I hope that uh, some of the the concepts that we discussed here today help agencies and your EIS contractors work together to do that. This is, a, this is not an agency problem. It's not a contractor problem. It's a government-wide problem <coughs> excuse me, for the transition. So um, once those task orders are awarded, um, contractors have to run like crazy and so do the agencies and it helps if you're running in the same direction. So communicate often, early and frequently and, uh, and, and openly and honestly. And so what we tried to present today are some real life situations and you heard it from the EIS contractors, those that you'll be working with going forward. And, and they likewise, those are 
EIS contractors who are on the call with us heard from the agencies, their perspectives as well. Um, so it's about addressing those things, like I said, openly and honestly, and with realism, to, to reiterate what Nick uh, emphasized earlier. Um, so the, um, I'm going to steal Bill's new alliteration, Festival of Pink Finger Pointing. Maybe it's not new, but I have <laughs> A Festival of Finger Pointing is not fun. It sounds like a fun festival, but it wouldn't be, and it's also not the way to get through transition faster. So um, with that in mind, yeah, again, as, as uh, Scott explained, this was recorded, so you should be able to get to it uh, once it's released. And if you're on the, the Adobe Connect pod, you can download a copy of the slides right now yourself. Um, and if you have any other, uh, if you need any additional help, Scott, if you want to flip to the next slide, please. We have uh, on slide number 35 here multiple ways to get help. Uh, immediately, you can go at any time, day or night, go to our website and listen to the uh, online training that we have available there. We have some newly released ones on telecommunications and EIS pricing structures. There are, um, there's FOOG e-learning, there's MOPS e-learning, there's a, a lot of e-learning stuff you can access whenever you want to. And if you need a person to help you, come to GSA through your, the agency manager or the technology service managers, or also through the help desk, which is on our website, both the EIS transition webpage and the EIS site itself. Do you have any concluding remarks, Scott? Just, uh, just one last thing, and that is there, some of you aren't able to see this or download the, uh, the information, so I want you to, to copy down this email if, if you're in that situation, and that's E-I-S-T-C-C -C dot training at GSA dot gov. And any questions about anything today, materials, what happens, where do I go, please shoot us an email and we will answer that question or get it going to the right person to make sure that you do get an answer. So um, some of that happened today. Everybody that's registered that we have an email for will receive a completion certificate. But if you attended and we didn't capture that, you know, you didn't get one, please let us know via that email address and we'll make sure that we get that out to you. So nothing further than I think we've, we've got all the information out there on how to reach us and we will now follow up with everything we need to do and that's it. And I'd like to just thank our EIS contractors again for their ongoing participation. And we, we made a request for active, participa active participation in our workshop, and you all have stepped up to that, and we appreciate that. So thank you, Granite, AT&T, BT Federal, Mettel, Harris, Verizon, CenturyLink, Core, and Microtech. So thank you all, and thank you, everyone who participated today. Happy Halloween.